Good afternoon to you all. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the Digital Futures Group here at the IIEA. You're all very welcome to our webinar here today on countering disinformation, online disinformation, actions taken and challenges ahead with Paolo Cesarini, who is head of the Media Convergence and Social Media Unit in the European Commission. You're very welcome, Paolo, and thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us in the IIEA. We appreciate it very much indeed. Paolo will speak for 25 minutes or so, and then I will go to you, the audience, to ask for any comments or questions, which you can send in through the function at the bottom of your, your screen. I'd really appreciate if you gave your name and uh, affiliation when you're asking a question. That would be very helpful to us. Also, you could join us on Twitter, and our Twitter handle is at IIEA. Paolo, your presentation today is very timely on at least two fronts, if not more. For the general public, discussion of online fake news and disinformation is a feature of our day-to-day -day lives. But it's also very timely, Paolo, in relation to your own work in the Commission and of great interest to us here in Ireland. Your colleague, as you know, Kieran Kazan, the BAI, BAI, I know is working with you and your colleagues on the assessment of the implementation of the Code of Practice and Disinformation. And Jane Souter and Eileen Cullity, from, both from DCU, have published Ireland's country-specific reports. So as you can see, there is a, a, a really good interest here. And we've also set up a commission on, for the future of media with Professor Breen McGrath. So there's a lot of action in the general uh, public here taking place and involvement of people uh, within the country. So Paula, we know your discussion will focus on European policy response with a particular focus, as I've said, on the code of practice on disinformation. This code, which was introduced in 2018, is now under review. Um, and you, Paola, will assess the effectiveness and discuss the best future policy options to protect society, but also to protect democracy from the threat of disinformation. I'd like to give a little background to you, uh, uh, Paolo. Uh, you have a distinguished career uh, presently in DG Connect in the European Commission as head of media convergence and social media. He personally previously worked in the International Labour Organization as a member of the Legal Service and the European Commission's Directorate General Office for Competition as the head of antitrust for a variety of economic sectors. Paolo has also taught in the University of Siena and Mount Pelier on EU competition law. So Paolo, we're really pleased to have you with us today and we look forward to your presentation. The screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Joyce. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you today. And uh, uh, I warmly thank uh, the IIEA for this uh, invitation. It gives me indeed the opportunity to focus on an issue that is becoming in increasingly important and increasingly present in the political debates, both at national and at EU level. Uh, at the core of this debate, <clears throat> there is, in broad strokes, uh, the challenges that are raised by the digital transformation of our uh, media landscape. Uh, and with the uh, increasing power and influence that is exercised by the major, the largest, online platforms that uh, had become, as you know, as everybody knows, a privileged channel for access information for the vast majority of the citizens. But also, they have increasingly, are increasingly, playing a role in uh, moderating content that it is indeed produced by third parties, by users, uh, they are not produced by the platforms, 
But the platforms increasingly with their own sophisticated methods for content selection and distribution, driven by algorithm, algorithms uh, and uh, other recommender systems, really shape, have been able to shape and therefore moderate the uh, distribution of content and eventually the, uh, the manner in which the public discourse and the debate take uh, uh, place. They have become a sort of public squares, public spaces, where if on the one side, a larger number of people get access to uh, a platform that uh, enable them to make their voice heard, on the other side, it gives also the possibility to hostile actors to manipulate this debate. And there are several vulnerabilities which are built into the platform services, of which uh, I will mention some in a second, that needs to be addressed. Uh, but I want to, before getting into the core of the, of the issues, uh, I would like also to remind another important contextual factor. Uh, the digital transformation of the media landscape, it is also accompanied by a profound distress that the COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated in terms of economic sustainability of the media industry at large. We know that uh, the main drivers for revenues for journalism and media is uh, uh, based on a, mom, uh, on a model that draws resources from, from advertising. And we know that advertising revenues are captured more and more by the large platforms. Mm -hmm. So th this element join up with the first point that I made, the increasing presence and power that it is uh, uh, handled by uh, large private uh, uh, online platforms. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the other element which I would like to flesh out from the outset is that uh, tackling the phenomenon of disinformation online, uh, it is a daunting task. It's a daunting task because it is easy to, to take the slippery slope to uh, envisage measure, measures that in fact moderate free speech and uh, limit the uh, freedom of expression. Uh, uh, that's why the commission since 2018 has taken an approach which, is, uh, which recognizes, which acknowledges that this information is a multifaceted problem and requires a multi-dimensional response. So going back to 2018, in particular to the action plan against disinformation, uh, the, uh, this complexity has been translated into a, a portfolio, let's say, of actions at different levels. Uh, the need was felt uh, to strengthen First of all, the institutional capabilities to detect, analyze, and expose these information campaigns. That applies in particular as far as the Commission is concerned, or as far as the EU institutions are concerned, uh, to the uh, strengthening of the capabilities within the STRATCOM task force, within the external action service, uh, to make them more able to uh, identify and counteract influence operations that are very often driven by foreign actors. Uh, on, the, on another front, uh, another important uh, work strand consists in uh, making the cooperation between member states much more effective mm -hmm. by, by enhancing exchange of information, best practices, and possibly uh, uh, devising joint responses. Uh, that has translated into the creation of what is called a rapid alert system, where representatives from different member states, experts from different member states, com uh, communicate easily between them relevant information and exchange views and uh, develop hopefully good practices for the future. 
the fourth, the third strain of action, it is really the work with the platforms. Uh, the, the attempt here, it is to increase transparency and accountability for the platforms while respecting one fundamental principle, which is the freedom to conduct business for them. So without uh, interfering with the uh, choices that belong to any business in terms of designing their services and providing uh, value for uh, the users. And the fourth main strand of action, it is about uh, raising awareness of uh, uh, citizens and thereby uh, increasing societal resilience. Uh, here, very important, it is the uh, policies that needs to be uh, boosted to increase the, the level of education of people, mm. the level of media literacy for all audiences, young generations, but also elderly people to, to, uh, to make them more aware of the manner in which the information is distributed nowadays online and therefore to develop a, a critical thinking and a critical approach when they uh, uh, access information online. Um, uh, I will not mention, I will not uh, spend time to uh, to on another very important, uh, uh, otherwise very important element, which is all the actions taken by the Commission in order to strengthen the resilience of the electoral systems as such, to ensure the integrity of elections against a number of threats where disinformation is one of the threats, but where cyber attacks to inf voting infrastructures, and where the, uh, the transparency, for instance, in terms of funding, in terms of, uh, of political parties, and in terms of uh, uh, transparency of uh, political communications, it is very uh, crucial to ensure that the political debate, particularly during electoral campaigns, it is transparent and unintelligible for all voters. But now let me come back to, uh, uh, an, uh, to the point which is closer to my work, to my daily work, which is the uh, cooperation and the work with the online platforms. Um, I was mentioning before that uh, uh, the uh, services are very diversified, but they all have in common a, a very uh, important uh, evolution in terms of the ability to sort out content, to devise me mechanisms that correspond more and more to the user's interest and therefore the algorithms that are in place in order to present the content to the audiences are increasingly important yes. in shaping the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the information diet. <laughs> I would, play, I would say, of users. Uh, but also I mentioned that there are vulnerabilities whereby hostile actors can ex, uh, 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 amplify their narratives. They make their voice louder, mm -hmm. to use an image, to the detriment of other uh, voices. So in a way by compressing this, the, the space for freedom of expression of other. These techniques that are designed to manipulate the systems to increase the visibility, the reach, the speed at which a, 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 a disinformation narrative may reach their intended audiences uh, are now increasingly well known. Uh, that is uh, the uh, famous click baiting uh, strategies whereby information is treated as a uh, appeal, uh, as designed in order to appeal uh, audience attention and uh, uh, to create uh, spaces where the placement of uh, commercial ads are uh, producing uh, clicks and therefore revenues for the publishers of such uh, uh, news. There is also uh, uh, an increased use of uh, micro-targeting techniques in combination with, uh, uh, um, with uh, uh, sponsoring of uh, certain content. This is clear for political advertising, but is also clear for uh, socially engaged or issue-based uh, advertising, 
where the uh, wider distribution of that type of content, because supported by uh, advertising investments, reach the intended audience uh, through the combination of uh, a very fine-tuned set uh, of criteria that appeal to those audience and may have the effect to strengthen their beliefs and therefore to uh, uh, strengthen the uh, narratives that support those beliefs. Another, another technique is the, uh, what in English you call astroturfing, right? Which, is a, 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 which uh, consists in uh, creating the impression on, uh, on the audiences that there is a large support for uh, specific stories through the use of uh, artificial manipulations of the media, such as the creation of uh, fake accounts, the use of fake accounts, the, use, the uh, replication of certain stories through bots, but also through the uh, uh, use of fake engagements that increase the popularity of a, of a specific content and therefore make it more likely for this content to be visible to larger uh, audience. Just to name a, a few and quite known uh, techniques. Uh, but the techniques are fast evolving and indeed uh, they increasingly uh, involve the co a combination of automatic systems or direct manipulations of the technologies with the intervention of the humans. Uh, the, the creation of groups, the, the operation of coordinated groups that plan and then execute deliberate disinformation campaigns with a specific political in general, but could also be economic uh, uh, incentives. Uh, <clears throat> Fourthly, I would like to mention the fact that, uh, uh, and, uh, that the uh, algorithms that are built into the services uh, very often do not, uh, 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 are not understandable for the general uh, public for the users themselves. Why I see what I see. And I know that what I see is different from what other users see because uh, there are a number of signals that uh, drive the selection of the content algorithmically that take into account the popularity, as I said, but also my own personal preferences. It is unclear, however, uh, to what extent uh, uh, the uh, authoritativeness of the information sources, the trustworthiness of the media that are distributed in this way, it is also equally factored in, in this algorithmic architecture that um, at the end of the day determine what we see, what we know, the manner in which we interpret the societal debate as it evolves. Uh, um, then I would like now to turn to the code of practice because the code of practice matches quite well these vulnerabilities and these uh, risks that are inherent to the development of social media technologies and other online uh, uh, systems for uh, distribution of content uh, uh, over the internet. The code of practice, it is uh, uh, aimed at scrutinizing the art placement, make political and issue-based uh, uh, advertising more transparent. It is aimed at inciting the platforms to be uh, active, proactive, and to report on the action that they take when they identify inauthentic behavior, the use of uh, manipulative techniques online that alter the integrity of their own services. The code of practice is also very much concerned about uh, the, 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 the need to empower the consumers, to empower the users, so the, to, the, to make them uh, more aware of the functioning of the uh, content selection algorithms and also to, be, uh, to make them able to easily access authoritative sources and a diversified number of sources that are equally uh, 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 authorities. So when I say authorities, I mean sources that are uh, uh, following good, ethical, professional, journalistic principles, which are, are, as you know, controlled, regulated, 
to a certain extent, or self-regulated in the case of the press, more regulated uh, uh, through governmental action when it comes to broadcasting, but still have a, their own framework for trustworthiness. Um, they could take also into account that uh, there is a fundamental problem of asymmetry of information. The data that uh, the platforms uh, gathers and use uh, and that concerns their own users is certainly much more vast than the uh, information that the public authorities that should exercise an oversight on the systems or even the user themselves can, uh, can, uh, can have. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the point here is uh, to engage the platforms in a more uh, constructive cooperation, both with the fact-checking, independent fact-checking community, and with the research community, with the, with the scientists that can make sense out of the data and, make, uh, and can make, draw conclusions or devise measurements in order to understand the importance of the threats posed by the disinformation by you know, uh, designing models that track the distribution and therefore the propagation of this virus, this uh, information okay. virus, and, and therefore make, contribute to raise the awareness of uh, the uh, public and increase the resilience of our societies in that manner. Uh, what is the, uh, what is the uh, conclusions that we can draw, the temporary conclusion, the provisional conclusions that we can draw after uh, a couple of years of operation of the code of practice? The commission has published the 10th of June, a few weeks ago. Uh, sorry, the 10th of September. Sorry, my mistake. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, uh, an assessment of the code of practice. It emphasized that there are certain, undoubtedly, there are uh, important achievements that, uh, uh, that have been, that, that have been, um, that have materialized thanks to this self-regulatory approach. Um, I mean, I could uh, quote some figures uh, regarding the number of ads, for instance, that have been rejected because they were uh, actually misleading or misrepresenting the uh, identity of the uh, of the uh, of the authors of these uh, um, ads, uh, figures that concerns the number of uh, landing pages that have been identified uh, have systematic purveyors of this information and therefore demonetized, demonetized, demonetized. I could mention also the progress that has been made in creation of public library, libraries, accessible libraries for political ads. Uh, although everything is not absolutely perfect, but there are progress that needs to be acknowledged. Uh, I could also mention figures that concerns the number of closed accounts that follows the detection of manipulative uh, behavior and authentic behavior, and, and also the, uh, the higher level of transparency that today we have concerning the actors that carry out this uh, organized campaign uh, by uh, uh, means of AstroTurf techniques. Uh, all this is certainly uh, laudable. I think uh, it is an encouraging uh, step forward compared to the situation we had uh, back, you know, you remember in 2016 when the, the word fake news uh, was, uh, uh, became the word of the year and uh, with the <clears throat> all the uh, concerns that were uh, uh, arising around the uh, uh, the, 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 the influence uh, that fake news had in the uh, elections, the presidential elections of 2016 in the US and also for the Brexit referendum. We know uh, that we are in a better place today compared to that, at the, to, compared to that time. But we know also that the, uh, there's still a, a lot of work uh, to be done. Uh, the assessment uh, shows uh, in, in the first place, that the implementation of the commitments is not always consistent, and the commitment itself, they are not sufficiently clear in order to be actionable 
and, and, uh, and uh, uh, subject to uh, meaningful monitoring. So the platforms take different uh, strands of action and their own action are not always comparable. Uh, and, uh, and, this, uh, and this also is coupled with the fact that the actions are not taking the same speed and width across the union. Different member states are better served than other member states. Another element is that the definitions that we are used to, uh, the terms that are, we are used to uh, uh, use to explain the phenomena like disinformation, misinformation, foreign influence operations, inauthentic coordinated behavior, and so on and so forth. So there are terms that there are still working definitions. They, are, uh, uh, they, they need to be probably better defined. And there are certain terms like issue-based advertising that have not been defined at all. A, a third element that is, I think it's worth pointing out is that um, the code in itself has some gaps. Some gaps and uh, the, the most important uh, ones, I think, is the fact that they do not include a, a set of key performance indicators against which would be possible for public authorities to uh, monitor the evolution of the threats and also the effectiveness of the policies put in place by the platforms to, uh, uh, to tackle those threats. Uh, there are uh, issues that remain unanswered, like uh, is it legitimate to use micro-targeting techniques when it comes uh, to political advertising within the context of political campaign? Should there be a different, uh, 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 a different regime that applies for commercial ads and political ads? Uh, and uh, you know the uh, consequences that the use of personal data for micro-targeting purposes may have, uh, and the scandal uh, of Cambridge Analytica is still, I think, very vivid in all our minds. Um, also, I think the, uh, uh, the understanding of what it means, manipulative techniques that amplify content online to the detriment of other pieces of content, of content needs to be further elaborated uh, and because these techniques evolves all the time. So there are gaps in the code that would be important to plug. And finally, uh, well, you know, the, the code of practice is self-regulatory measure. It is self-regulation and, uh, and therefore cannot uh, address uh, issues that increasingly become important. They, uh, these issues are, first of all, uh, the inclusiveness of the approach. Are all the relevant services really participating into this joint endeavor to apply policies that are designed and effective in curbing this information? There are actors that are not present yet in the conversation, not only other online platforms, but also other specific services, which increasingly are becoming important, uh, like end-to-end uh, uh, -end, uh, messaging services. Mm. Uh, WhatsApp has played an important role during the COVID crisis in, in uh, enhancing the possibility for people to spread stories and myths and conspiracy theories, for instance. Um, but also, if you look uh, from the uh, perspective to follow the money and therefore to ensure that this information does not become a business where uh, people can uh, uh, enrich themselves through clickbaiting. Uh, well, there are important actors from the ad tech uh, sector that are still not part or fully part of this uh, endeavor. So inclusiveness. The second is about oversight. Uh, Certainly, a top-down approach with a stronger regulatory framework would be necessary in order to empower the authorities and to establish the appropriate mechanism to, uh, to uh, uh, exercise and oversight on the functioning of the systems, including the auditing of the uh, uh, algorithms uh, that uh, uh, shape the distribution 
of content online and including also the effectiveness of the um, mechanism put in place in order to avert the risk of deliberate manipulation, uh, in particular by foreign actors. Uh, there is no sanctions, by the way. So what would be the uh, consequence uh, in case of insufficient, uh, 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 insufficient uh, application or incomplete application of this money? And fundamentally, and I would uh, uh, close here the list of the shortcoming, it is also important to realize that there are uh, important questions around the protection of fundamental rights that requires specific redress mechanisms uh, that ensure that uh, there is no abuse neither from the side of the users, not on the side of the platform, so not excessive disproportionate measures that silence people, but at the same time, measures that enable people to be held responsible for what they do when they are online. So taking into account this dimension also require probably a, a, a stronger framework. And I conclude because uh, here we are at the point where the reflection is in full swing in our offices. Uh, we have uh, planned three important initiatives. The Commission has planned three important initiatives. One it is the Digital Services Act that will have, among other things, to uh, uh, modernize the rules for information society services in the context of the review of the e-commerce directive. And certainly there will be uh, uh, considerations that are relevant also for harmful content like, such as disinformation particularly in terms of setting tr transparency standards uh, uh, for, uh, for platforms that could be addressed uh, in that framework. But there, there is also another important issue, which is the European Democracy Action Plan uh, that will uh, be uh, adopted by the end of the year. Uh, at the same time, I would say that the first proposals for the, the Digital Services Act where, in, uh, where additional issues, specific aspects that pertain to the defense of democracy against uh, um, uh, foreign interference and uh, manipulations of uh, media to steer the debate and to blur the uh, boundaries of the different opinions by, uh, by putting, uh, by using conspiracy theories and disinformation as a mechanism to sow distrust, confusion, and and increase polarization in societies. Well, these elements that probably require specific considerations, the, uh, the European Democracy Action Plan, we have to consider whether in addition to improvement to the code of practice, it would be necessary also to provide another layer mm -hmm. of uh, 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 legislation that would make these commitments more binding, more compelling for uh, platforms to uh, uh, that play a systemic role in the information space. Third, it is the media and audiovisual action plan, also scheduled for adoption by the end of the year. We come out, or we try to come out, from a, a coronavirus crisis that have profoundly affected the uh, media ecosystem. Uh, media journalists, quality journalists, professional journalism is a pillar for our democracies and the need to provide an active and substantial support for uh, uh, independent journalism and for independent uh, professional media, it is certainly felt as a challenge that needs to be taken and addressed. So part of the resources of the Rescue and Recovery Fund, as well as the mainstream, future mainstream programs under the uh, multi-annual financial frameworks that will kick in in 2021, will have to be devoted to this, uh, to address this problem. Uh, the problem that concerns the rescue of the industry in the face of the consequences <clears throat> of the crisis, but also in the longer term to favorize, to support the transformation of the uh, media industry and its adaptation to the challenges of the digital world. Uh, I would stop there. 
I think I took a bit more than 25 minutes. I think it took 30 minutes. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer uh, uh, any question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paolo, for your very um, insightful and excellent presentation. And I suppose your presentation has shown the complexity of the issue. Uh, a lot going on, a lot done, as they say, and but a lot on the horizon to address these issues. So thank you very much for that. You certainly have got our audience thinking, and I'll go right away to the questions. And um, the first question here is, is from uh, Kieran Kazan, uh, mm -hmm. who, who you know. Um, and he asks, and he's from the BAI, he asks what needs to be done to make cooperation between member states more effective? And can we expect to see specific proposals in the area presented by the Commission in the context of the, what you've talked about, the proposed Digital Service Act and the democracy action, both due, as you've mentioned, before the end of the year? Uh, yeah, very good question. Indeed, this is one of the elements that uh, are driving uh, the ongoing reflection. Certainly, they need to have uh, uh, a network of authorities that are uh, um, devoting uh, their time and resources uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, overseeing the uh, uh, platforms. It is, um, I mean, I would say it's a no-brainer. <laughs> it's yeah. a no-brainer. The need is obvious. The question is now, it is, uh, concerns the identification of the, uh, the authorities which are the best place uh, in that respect. Mm. Uh, when it comes to disinformation, and now I express my own personal views, I think that would be uh, logical to think of the audiovisual authorities mm. and ERGA as the network, already existing network, of, uh, of European uh, audiovisual authorities as the uh, entity, the best place mm. to exercise this function. Uh, why? But essentially because uh, given the experience gained across audiovisual services and the issues that arise in that contest that at the end of the day, many of them not different from the issues that arise in the online digital media context, that would ensure a more coherent and more consistent approach for all media that being increasingly convergent should not be treated differently or subject to uh, radically different standards. Mm -hmm. Uh, then the question is how to empower, of course, uh, such authorities to expand their cap capabilities and competences beyond uh, uh, what they do uh, now, so the audiovisual services, both on and offline, and to, inc to, uh, to include also other type of services that play a role in the dissemination of this information. There is also another issue, very important, which is, uh, is the oversight uh, 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 on the platforms that is designed to capture the trends and the threats mm. inherent to disinformation. And is designed also to assess the validity, the effectiveness uh, of the policies uh, and the actions taken by uh, those who are responsible for the diffusion of this uh, content, so the online platforms. Is this function uh, should this function be exercised only by public authorities? Or should there be uh, indeed, in order to avoid uh, criticism about uh, the possibility to create a censorship machine mm -hmm. uh, driven by governmental agendas, uh, you know, or there should there be space for a, an independent entity mm -hmm. that study the phenomenon that make analysis uh, with all the guarantees of independency that uh, uh, are required there. So from a scientific mm. point of view, to exercise an oversight that is driven by a scientific program mm. and not by a, a political program as a necessary uh, tool mm. that could actually advise then the actions that the public authorities should take uh, 
in function of this enhanced knowledge about what mm. is going on. Mm. I think that pleads very much for having this combination of public authorities with the specific uh, competence and knowledge of the media mm. at large and a, a, a well-structured community of fact checkers and researchers that look from the point of view of the society, uh, the, the nature of the threats and the effectiveness of the measures. Mm -hmm. The combination of these two elements, I think it is uh, 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 to be very deeply considered. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, you, uh, you give me the possibility to mention here that the European Digital Media Observatory is exactly trying to build up a strong community of checkers and researchers that could act as an advisory board for, for a national uh, uh, audiovisual authorities in order to take decisions which are not politically tainted, but are based on evidence. Mm. Uh, that, that's interesting because you mentioned earlier in your, your presentation about COVID-19, we've learned to see the importance of um, individual involvement, but mainly scientific analysis for government and for public authorities. So that independence and trust can be seen by the public as well. I think that's, you know, uh, very important to, to, um, to emphasize. And, um, but Ono Dell would like maybe to follow up on this question, Paolo. He's from Trinity College Law School in Dublin. And he wants to ask you, maybe, maybe an unnecessary question, but how confident are you that the three forthcoming EU initiatives will have a significant positive effect? <laughs> well, to, the, to, to, to um, uh, anticipate what could be the effect of measures that still needs to be designed, Yes. It is pretty <laughs> difficult. It's a difficult question. It's a, yeah, it is a very much crystal balling. Uh, at the same time, you can see the, uh, that the combination of these trends, mm. or these main three strands of work, should produce results. Yeah. We are acting on ensuring a level playing field for all uh, information society services. Mm. We, we will act in order to identify the specific threats to democracy posed uh, by uh, the transformation of media into the digital uh, space. We are acting to support professional journalism and professional media. I think the combination of these three elements should actually bring us uh, out of the turn, that the difficult turn that the COVID crisis has put us in front mm. of, and, uh, and I think the future is promising. Uh, I, would, should actually, uh, I should also mention another initiative, which is the Digital Education Action Plan that is yes. also in the making, which uh, from the point of view, increasing societal resilience and, and to devote resources and create, building a community of experts uh, around this uh, important theme should also bring another the, piece the, to the yeah. puzzle and increase the, increase the through synergies through synergetic interaction between these different initiatives we should be able to have an impact in the future and um, you, you mentioned the european digital media observatory and i understand that they're proposing to set up a series of regional hubs is that for that purpose that you're talking about and i'm just wondering do you think that ireland would be a good place for a regional hub given the platforms that are here and you know, would that be an invaluable addition? And is that the reason why we're looking at the idea of regional hubs? Uh, yeah, no, uh, I think this community, this multidisciplinary community mm -hmm. of checkers and research, academic researchers should be seen as a network of networks mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it is not a centralized entity that can drive a research program uh, strategy alone. Uh, the reality is that the information markets are very much segmented along national boundaries, or perhaps more generally around linguistic 
yes. uh, boundaries. Uh, so uh, also the shapes and the forms that uh, these information campaigns and conspiracy theories uh, takes uh, differs very much from one area to another area. The presence of national or transnational hubs, but with the specific knowledge of, lo of uh, local information environments is fundamental. It is fundamental. It is important to have it in Ireland, mm. as it is important to have it in the Baltic states or yes. in any other member state uh, uh, that suffer from uh, this phenomenon. And I think all member states to yes. a, 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 a larger or, or, or smaller extent are suffering from from this phenomenon. So the, our idea, it is going step by step with, that, uh, with the staggered uh, funding um, uh, uh, programs uh, to create uh, this network of regional hubs or national hubs for research mm. on this information connected to the central platform, the EDMO, the European Digital Media mm. Observatory as a central platform with the uh, uh, European University Institute acting now as a coordinator of this central platform, but to act, in, to, uh, to act together yeah, with, yeah. A strong, with a strong uh, uh, autonomy uh, for uh, each uh, hub, but also with the conscious uh, choice uh, to engage into coordinated research programs uh, to, to maximize the effect. And just as an aside, Paolo, we're, we're having um, Miguel Madura from the uh, observatory coming to speak to us on the, the uh, 3rd of November. So I think our audience might put that in their diary because we'll follow up on some of the things that you've been speaking about. But also there's a question here now as a follow up on this area of networking and cooperation from Seamus Allen in the IIEA. And he, he asked the question, Paolo, you mentioned the importance of cooperation between EU member states. Are there any long-standing differences between EU member states on countering disinformation due to experience or cultural factors? Or are there country, you know, are most countries mainly on the same page? Uh, the risk of fragmentation is always present. Mm. Um, the approaches followed by the member states so far are not uh, aligned. Um, the, um, the risk is that as the uh, problem is, becomes more and more pr uh, prominent, uh, the risk is that uh, all member states will take their own initiatives and there will be a substantial lack of uh, uh, uniformity in the approach which would be a, a, a serious problem because the uh, internet, as you know, uh, knows no borders, a phenomenon, exactly, yeah. it is transnational, and it cannot be tackled only by one member state. That requires a, st a strong cooperation with, uh, between uh, member states. So indeed, one of the, uh, one of the uh, challenges that the upcoming uh, initiatives have to address it is also how to ensure that uh, when it comes to the online platforms, for instance, and the, and the regulation of our, our online platforms, that we have the right tools in place that ensure minimum harmonization, but also the necessary flexibility that take account on a one side, yes. the diversity of the services provided by the platforms, mm -hmm. and on the other side, the diversity of the conditions in different member states. Having said that, I think the need for, a, for a, a set of standards that ensure that all member states take their own actions along the same nice. direction, it is very important. The risk, again, you can see it in other parts of the world, Singapore or another part of the world, where you know, under the cover or under the pretext of fighting this information, uh, uh, the, the legislator, in fact, uh, set out rules that are silencing the opposition and reduce the diversity of opinion that can be expressed. Yeah. You know, that framework, I think you've emphasized, really, really important. And we've had a question which is about the empowering citizens from Eileen Cullity. 
from Dublin City University in the Fulgio Institute. And she asked the question, Paolo, in terms of empowering citizens to understand ag algorithms, are accountability audits by experts a better approach? This comes into your focus on the scientific side, a better approach by, ex um, by experts, a better approach than increased transparency between a, 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 a algorithms are highly, com because they are very high complex. Algorithms, sorry, are highly complex. I'll say that again. In terms of empowering citizens to understand algorithms, are accountability audits by experts a better approach than increased transparencies because algorithms are highly complex? Yeah, uh, I fully agree with this statement. Um, it's a question which is also a statement. Yes. <laughs> and I fully agree with it. Um, because uh, there is a limit to transparency. First of all, because uh, uh, algorithms are indeed very complex and uh, uh, people are not generally uh, uh, engineers or have no time to devote for, <laughs> to, to a full understanding on the manner in which the algorithms work. So the risk is uh, that uh, uh, would not contribute a near transparency of algorithms will not really contribute to enhance resilience and awareness in, uh, in people. Yes, perhaps we all know in uh, the, the, the audience which are better informed know, uh, uh, generally speaking, how the algorithm, algorithms works, uh, how, uh, uh, how uh, the popularity and the personalization uh, in the distribution of content uh, on, for instance, social media services, plays a role in probably this knowledge, it is not available to everybody. Mm. Uh, and that is important that instead is available to everybody. Mm. Uh, but there is also a limit to transparency because uh, disclosing too much regarding the manner in which the argument functions, then the risk of gaming by hostile actors of the systems okay. increases. So uh, it's a fine balance. Yes, indeed. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the, the focus put on accountability, in my view, is very, very relevant. Mm -hmm. Accountability leads us to a fundamental question. So what should be the uh, optimal architecture for these content selection algorithms in order to ensure that the quality content emerge, this information is diluted, mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and there are no discriminations between different sources of information that are equally trustworthy. And that leads to the subsequent question, which is being discussed by the member states in the context of the Audiovisual Council, what would be the trustworthiness indicators that could enable a, uh, a, a, a better architecture for algorithms and also an auditing system of the function of these algorithms that are based on criteria that are verifiable. So mm. uh, with, uh, the, with the COVID crisis, we have seen some improvements because indeed uh, citizens have been able to access to Facebook, uh, to treat Twitter, through uh, YouTube, uh, uh, much more prominently uh, uh, content coming from uh, public health authorities, coming from the WHO, coming mm. from reputable media. That has happened. Mm. And, and that is a good way to be pursued. But we need to ensure that there is an oversight body, an auditing system indeed, mm. that uh, verify and control for the manner in which this prioritization takes place. Mm. Objective, non-discriminatory criteria, that reflect the trustworthiness of the sources on the basis of, uh, of, of, a, um, on, of a dialogue that should include all actors, publishers, yes, yeah. broadcasters, uh, platforms themselves. The sector has to devise them. Well, Carlo, that, that's probably, thank you very much for that answer, very, very thorough. And it's probably a good place, a uh, positive note to, to stop on. And on, I'd like to thank on your behalf and on our behalf, the audience for asking 
some really interesting questions and for their, for their participation. Um, the hour is nearly up now, so we're going to have to close, unfortunately. So I'd like to thank our team here at the IIEA, uh, the, our Lorcan Mullally and Sarah Bourke on the uh, production side, and Seamus Allen, our digital researcher, um, for all their work in preparing this um, webinar. And of course, I'd like to thank you, Paolo, very sincerely for a really fascinating presentation on disinformation. I think you've showed the complexity of it, but also I think really importantly, you've seen, you've given an assessment of where we're at and what we not have to do. And also the idea of linking the countries together with independence, with scientific bodies. And we see now in some way the vehicles that are there to make this happen. As, a, as you've mentioned, the Digital Service Act, and we've got Christine Canelby um, coming to speak to us on the Digital Service Act on the um, 21st of October. So, you know, the conversation will continue. Um, but also the European Democracy Action Plan, which I think really offers enormous amount in terms of empowering citizens and the media and audiovisual action plan. And I think people will be very interested to hear of your focus there, emphasizing the independence of good journalism and also funding necessary to bring, to help transform that particular industry in this time, which has been very challenging for, for it. So thank you so much. Um, as I said, the conversation will continue. We really appreciated your contribution, Paolo, and we look forward to seeing you again. So thanks to you and thanks to everybody who's listened to our video with great attention. I know so stay safe and keep well. Thank you very much. Thank Goodbye you. to everybody. Bye-bye.